Will, Dr. Bob has landed. You know, I, I am so excited to have, to me, the best sports psychologist, performance coach. Doc goes by the, or the confidence doctor. Dr. Bob, welcome in to Beyond the Fairway. Yeah, Doug, Will, it's great to be here, you know, with you guys and uh, really excited to be Beyond the Fairway. And That's congratulations right. on all of your success, 100 episodes. And is this number 101? 101. 101. You're, we're going to call wow. you the Dalmatian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Kind of reminds me of the old uh, Virginia Slim cigarette commercials. It's like 101 millimeters. You know, it's a silly, <laughs> a silly millimeter longer. You know, so yeah. So it's it's, it's a, a great honor to be number 101. I love well, that. Thank well, you. We appreciate you, Doc. And we we got a lot of things to kind of talk to you about because one thing that we want to do with our listeners. Uh, and the folks that view our show is we, you know, we talk to some of the coolest people in golf, influencers, celebrities, but it's rare, Will, that we get an opportunity to talk to somebody that, that can can really affect their game. And that's really what, what this whole episode is about as we're winding down the FedEx Cup season. Some people's seasons, Will, you're at the uh, the, the Curry Cup there at Lake Merced as, the, as their seasons are winding down. How do you goal set for the following season? We're going to get into a bunch of stuff, Doc, and we appreciate your time. But, but Will, how is the Curry Cup going right now? Man, I tell you, the Curry Cup is amazing. I am running around here with my, well, that my like a chick with my head cut off. But you know, the 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 Curry Cup is like a tour championship. You know, you, you yep. got you got Steph on the first tee box for these kids, and you know, uh, you see these kids who went on a season long points race similar to the uh, PGA Tour FedEx Cup point uh, race, and now we're on a, a KPMG underrated golf tour race. And seeing these kids how they perform in front of this big crowd, which kind of leads me to my first question. Uh, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, these these young kids, right, and we're talking about from a mental standpoint, uh, from an adult, you can also kind of, you know, have a language to kind of help them understand of, of the point that you're trying to make, you know. How do you relate to kids, though? You know, because kids don't have all the, the, the life experiences that an adult will have to where you can kind of make parables to get them in the point in the right direction. So what type of language do you use, Dr. Bob, when it comes to talking to kids and just get on the right track? Well, well, the, the whole point of it is I talk straight up, you know, to junior golfers. I mean, the same, you know, language I use, you know, for even my tour players. And this is the meat and potatoes. This is how you do it. And it always begins and ends with you. So you are the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And if it is to be, it has to begin and end with me. And so when I start talking to them about, you know, great performance, you know, you are what you think you are. I mean, even when I've been working with any of my players, I mean, the best of the best in the world and even my first time, you know, uh, junior players, I ask them this very basic question. Are you good? And they look at me and they go, what does that mean? I'm, I said, I'm in respect to your golfing talent. Are you good? And do you believe in your talent? And I'm looking for a knee jerk response there, Will and Doug. And when I have a player say, Yes, absolutely. I mean, I know right away that they have a deep set conviction that they believe in their talent because the most important thing for any golfer, whether a junior college, you know, tour player or whatever, even a player getting ready to step up on the first tee, you know, in Italy in the Ryder Cup is do I believe in my talent and will I let the good stuff show up today? And, and to me, that's really where you have to begin and end with it. It's all about your confidence. It's all about your attitude. And all of that is, you know, determined by your own mental and emotional uh, setup and your preparation. So we talk just really basic stuff to them. And when I try to keep it simple and specific, and I don't talk down to them, a lot of people say, well, you know, do you dumb it down? No, I think, you know, young people, even as junior players, as you guys, you know, know growing up, you had this intuitive sense. I mean, we know when we actually play in sports and you're the first one picked on a team, that intuitively tells you that, you know, you're a great player. So I want you on my team. Yeah. Or that or that you have, you know, the captain's a good friend of yours. So he wants you on the team or she wants you on the team. But we know that, you know, and little kids understand that. So yeah. we have to understand as adults, we sometimes get away from this notion of play. Because play, you know, as an acronym for means perform like a youth. And that's why I always hear all my, you know, 
grizzled veteran players go, it's just not any fun for me anymore. I'm making it work. I'm making it labored. So I'm always trying to keep it light, keep it fun, and, and keep it very simple and direct because the game of golf is tough enough. We don't need to be actually making it more difficult than it really is. No, I hear that, Doug. You, it, it, go ahead, Doug. You want me to go? Yep. Uh, Doug, so, Doug, be quiet. So here, here's the thing that where I'm at right here, Dr. Bob, and I'm glad you said, you know, making it um, uh, talk like an adult, we don't need to make game more difficult. Dr. Bob, how do we speak to the parents, not adding additional pressure to these kids? When we start talking about pressure, pressure is really defined, Will and Doug, as a factor or any combination of factors that increases the importance of one wanting to perform well. That's a great definition. Came by a wonderful uh, research. Keep by going, name, Dr. Bob. Keep by going. the name of Bowmeister. Yeah. So pressure, and we start talking about pressure, you're talking about perceived value. You're saying, you know, this is really important. So anytime you make something really important, you actually put a perceived value. If it didn't really mean anything to you, you wouldn't feel any pressure. And what happens to a lot of players, you know, young players especially, they want to impress, they want to compare themselves to others, and they want to please their parents. They, they really do. And so instead of just performing, they start to play to please and they're always looking over at their parents and their parents are saying you know do this do that and the funny thing is a lot of these parents you know even well intentioned are saying hey just have a good time relax you know just just play golf you're supposed to be having fun and then at the end of the day you know when they get back in the car and they look at these young players the first thing they do is what the hell did you do on number 12? What was that all about? And, you know, where's your head at? So there's a, you know, conflicting message here. And the one thing I always want to tell parents is let your player be creative. Give them the emotional freedom to just perform. If you've done a good job of helping them prepare, then I just need you to sit back and watch and observe. Yeah, Doc, but all these parents think their damn kids are going to play on a damn tour and they're going to, oh, they're going to be their that. meal ticket up out of the hood or out of the whatever, oh. what kind of strife. And and Dr. Bob, I, I need my kids shooting 68 at 11 years old because we got because <laughs> if we don't shoot this score, we can't get into this tournament and we can't go here. And and I feel like, and Will, I don't mean to speak for you, I feel like hmm. that's what I see. And, and give you a quick one, Doc, oh, yeah. before you respond is, you know, I used to work with a guy named Dennis Sprague back at the University of Kentucky back when I was like 16 or 17. And we talked about, you know, I was a junior golfer. And one of my biggest anxieties on the golf course was my mom's reaction to shots. Like I would hit a shot and instead of watching the ball fly, I would just look at my mom. And if she threw oh, her yeah. hands up and walked to the next tee box, I knew it sucked. If she just didn't react, I knew it was okay. And if she gave me a golf clap, I knew it was awesome. So like the thing is, is like sometimes, or do you ever, to, to dovetail off Will, just tell the parents to shut the hell up. I try to do it in a very diplomatic way. And the, and, the, <laughs> and, the way, and the way I do this is I always tell them, you know, this is a really tough game. And so I said, do you really want to help your son or your daughter? And they go, well, absolutely. And I'm sitting here going, I just need you to actually cut the cord. This is really what I call doing a sports parenectomy. We need to remove the parent from, you know, the child performer. All right. So, and really that's what I do. We sit down and have an agreement when I'm working with a junior player, elite junior player, or whoever it is, or with parents who are helicopter parents. <clears throat> I'm saying we need to come to a real agreement here. And I look at my player and I go, you are not playing for mom and dad. You're not playing for me. You're not playing for coach on your team. So as I say, if it's team will, and it's Team Doug, who are the three most important players that you really should be worried about and caring about when you're on the golf course? Mm -hmm. And the players will sit there and they'll go, well, well I thought mom and dad, but you already took them out. Um, I go, me is one of them. And they go, well, me, 
me, myself, and I. <laughs> that's your team out there. That's And that's where it begins and ends because golf, you are psychologically, physically, and emotionally almost naked out there. And no one can help you out there. You don't have any pinch hitters to come in or designated runners for you. You've got to do it all on your own. And that's the one thing that parents have to do. You know, allow your child to succeed, but also at the same time, allow them to fail. That was what, you know, the you know, Tiger's mom and dad did so well. They provided a foundation for Tiger to go out and play as well as he could. They also, you know, said, hey, listen, all right, you didn't do so well today. You know, what did you learn? So I am a real big advocate of you never really lose. You know, you win or you learn. But it, when you really lose, it's when you haven't learned anything from failing. You go, guys, I just didn't get it today. I just didn't have it. And you start, you know, worrying about this disease called excusitis. And you start making excuses for your performance. Oh, I didn't have enough time. Or, you know, my grips were too slick. Or, you know, I was playing with annoying partners. Those are all excuses, you know, and those don't exist, all right? And nobody really cares. I mean, nobody really cares. Yeah. So right. that's the whole point is trying to help parents understand. Give your children the freedom to play the game. And when they do that, you know, that makes them accountable, makes them responsible. It also makes them what we call psychologically hardy. They can actually, you know, take, you know, a hit, but they'll bounce back up. And that's the whole point, you know, about having grit and tenacity and, and being a hell of a competitor is that you can take a hit and, and you realize the game's tough, but you have to be tougher and you've got to be smarter. And you've got to be smarter than your doubt and better than any of your fears. And what that means is whatever, you know, is a shortcoming in your game, you need to develop competence and trust in that area. And when you do that, you know, your weakest link then becomes very solid. And now you can go out and play with this freedom that we call confidence. It's a, it's, it's a bit it's a bit cathartic. I mean, I would say that once you kind of have an understanding that you are free but you know when you have some of the outside variables that are being added to the adding to the game such as nil so uh, going back to what, what doug just mentioned uh you know adding pressure to getting college scholarship playing the lpj tour or pga tour you know Absolutely. now do you do you find yourself that you know with this new nil stuff is adding more pressure to these kids as well as parents i think again it's just another distraction because as a performer you have to ask yourself, what is it that I do best? When do I play my best? That's when we are totally absorbed into executing and doing the thing that we want to do. When you start worrying about you know, money, when you start worrying about cuts, when you start worrying about what other people think, you're actually just creating a foundation of doubt. And so for me, studying confidence over these many, many decades, you have to understand that confidence is sort of like this scale. On one side, you know, you've got, you know, a lot of trust, a lot of confidence. You're playing really well and it's really easy. And, and everybody's kissing your buns, telling you how damn good you are. And you go, wow, I feel bulletproof. But the moment that you actually miss a couple of shots, you miss that short putt, this was pillow feathers. Whoop, you, know, it, you know, now we've got bricks. We've got the doubt, and worry and the fear and what will people say to me and what will people think? And, and I know as, as, as little kids, you know, we have, you know, great intentioned aunts and uncles and grandparents. And they say, wow, you're really good, Will. You know, are you going to go out and win today? <laughs> you know, and you go out and you, you say, well, I hope so. And then when you come back in, they go, well, did you win? You know, and if you didn't, there's only two responses. Yes, I did. And no, thanks, Grandma, right. for asking me that. Right. Hey, Doug, how many times have we played junior golf? And I mean, it was an eye opening experience for me when I played junior golf and I, I see all the parents who are um, putting so much pressure on the kids. But when, you, when I see the parents finally get a golf club in their hand and they can't hit it past their shadow, it's like, why are you putting so much pressure on me as, <laughs> as, as, a, as a kid? And that's when I realized, like, there's no hope. There's no hope here. <laughs> well, the thing, Will and Doug, that I see a lot is that I have a lot of wonderful parents. I mean, they love their kids. 
sometimes unconditionally and sometimes conditionally. And I always ask them, I said, uh, you're, you're fairly, you know, quick, you know, to, to mention all the mistakes. And I asked them, do you play the game? And almost, you know, 80% of them go, no, I, I don't play the game or I, I don't play, you know, at a high level. I'm going, hmm. You know, maybe we need to kind of reconsider before we actually start jumping in here for a lot of things. And then they'll look at me and they'll go, okay, then direct me. And that's where I'm just not coaching, you know, the student athlete or the young player. I'm also coaching the family, you know, the support unit here. And you paid it, double for that, right, Doc? No, you know, got, I wish I did. Extra. Yeah, I, I wish I did. You know, but the <laughs> point of it is, I love, you know, what I do and I love working, you know, with families. So now it does become a team, whoever that person is, say it's team Smith. Now we become part of a unit, you know, myself, maybe the swing coach, you know, maybe, you know, a dietitian or whoever's on their team and mom and dad are absolutely vital and their input is vital. And I said, you see your son or your daughter more than anyone else. And you know him or her better than anybody else. I said, but at the same time, we need you know, to be able to give them this emotional freedom. And I keep talking about this concept because emotional freedom means you are who you are. And the most important thing that we can have and when we get on the golf course is this right here, to be comfortable in our own skin, to play the game that we want to play, and without the constraints or the judgments or the evaluations from the committee of them, whoever those people are. And those people could be other people, uh, credentialed, you know, onlookers. They could be coaches. They could be mom and dad, even great friends. Because one of the worst things, and I talk about this a lot, we're talking about junior golfers here. As a junior golfer, the first thing that people ask you when you come in, you will or Doug, they don't say, hey, did you guys stay emotionally stable in every shot out there? They don't ask that. The first we'll thing ask, they ask we'll you ask is, <laughs> what'd you shoot? What'd you shoot? And, and the reason why they ask you what you shot has nothing to do with you personally. Has everything to do about them because mm. they're comparing what they wow. did. And that is the first lesson you know, I teach all my kids. It isn't about them at all. And so, that's why you have to be able to disconnect from them so you can play your game on the golf course because the opponent is the golf course. It is the game. And if you beat the golf course, you'll probably, you know, do very well. Well, I'll let you take it because I'm going to, we got to get, I got to get some actionable items for our listeners to take to yeah. the golf course, but go ahead, Will. Yeah, no, I, I was, I was, you know, for the parents out there, when, when their, you know, child come off the golf course, what question, and you might say it in a roundabout way, but I want to get a little more direct and specific. What question do you ask the kid to where it wouldn't come across as, you know, did you win or did you lose? Good question. I heard this you know, a long time ago from one of my, my great mentors. And it's almost like having a Big Mac sandwich. And this is what parents need to hear. It's the Big Mac theory. A Big Mac is like the bun on the top. You got the two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, <laughs> and the super sauce. And you got a bun on the bottom. And one in the middle. If, don't forget the middle. Yeah, and one in the middle. Don't forget but the that bun, one. Though. Yeah, they, don't forget that one. But the bun at the top is very optimistic, very positive. You look at them, you go, hey, I'm really proud of the effort you did today. I know it wasn't your best day or it could have been a great day, but it's always something very optimistic, very supportive. So they don't put up, you know, the defense shield. Okay. Then we start getting into the meat and say, and this, I give them maybe 30 minutes to have a little bit of decompression time. You don't want to ask them. That is a super yes. key. That, that's that absolutely, so key. You, you know, we always say about a 30, 30 minute, let them come to you. Uh, or you, maybe you might ask them in a very non-confrontational way. Say, you know, what'd you think about today? You know, how did how did it, you know how did you feel about it? And if they lock down, they say, you know, I saw a couple of things out there that were really good, but there were you know a couple of concerns I had. And whenever you're ready to talk about them, I'd, I'd really like to kind of chat about it with you. Then they'll be more open to say, hey, you know, here's what it is. Then you can kind of give them a couple of different suggestions, you know, or then say what were you thinking about that shot in number 12? I just kind of want to know your decision-making because that is one of the key elements 
I mean, and it just helped, you know, Victor Hovland, you know, win the BMW championship. He said it didn't have anything to do with his talent hitting the golf ball, it had everything to do with his thinking. And what most mm -hmm. people forget is that this follows this action mm -hmm. follows thought. And if your thinking's in the right place, then everything else follows up. But that's, you know, sort of the meat right there. You're kind of getting into, you know, sort of the meat and potatoes of it. And then at the very end, you put on that extra bun at the end and you go, you know what? You're going to be great tomorrow. And I'll tell you what, I can't wait for us to actually use this feedback and go out and just really kick ass tomorrow. That's yeah. sort of that Big Mac, you know, theory that, you know, I have always used. And people always ask me, they say, and, and they, they make this comment, they go, you may be one of the most positive, dynamic people I've ever heard. And I'm going, it's funny because I've never told anybody to be positive ever, you know, on the yeah. golf course. And they go, why is that? And I go, well, you hear people go, come on now, be positive, relax, do this. But I remember a story about a little boy named Tommy who kept coming home with a bad report card on his spelling. And his father and mother were sitting there at the dinner table going, you just aren't positive enough. Now I need you to go into that spelling test tomorrow and be 100% positive that you're going to ace that thing. He looks at them and goes, okay. Next day at the supper, he brings in, you know, the paper. The dad takes a look at the paper. He looks at it and he goes, damn. He goes, you missed six out of 10. Tommy, I thought I told you to be positive. He goes, what happened? And Tommy looks at him and he goes, dad, I was 100% positive I was going to flunk that sucker. <laughs> so, and so ever since that time, I've never told anybody to be positive. I've told them to be very purposeful, have, you know, great intent, have great direction, you know, with their mindset and go out there and give themselves the freedom to express, you know, that developed talent that they have. Those are the keys, you know, to really, you know, tapping into a great mindset. Well, you talk hey, about keys and, and you brought him up there, Dr. Bob. So let's go ahead and get into this because what Victor Hovland did at the BMW championship, arguably, arguably one of the, the best performances of the season um, with how he was able to navigate the the terrain at the north course at olympia field so but but what i want to talk to you about dr bob is is there's this moment in in a round a good round of golf and we've all played it where we start to realize that we're doing something special we're doing something a little bit above board okay you go back to victor hovland's 61 he makes the turn if, I, if i'm correct he turned it two under par and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden back nine twenty eight, and he blitzes the field there so my a couple questions here and i want to start Let's talk about the zone, because when we look at the pressure that Victor was under, he came in, I want to say, six shots out of the lead. You know, there were some people that did pick him to win. I wasn't one of them. thought Scotty had that in the bag. But how the zone, it's like this elusive thing. It's kind of like, you know, I'm not going to make the comment I want to make, but it's kind of like this mythological spot, right? So um, how, do you, how do you access it, as, and then how do you access it when you need it? Or, or is it just a a state of being for a day or a week or a, a period of time. What is the zone? Tell me. The zone is not a magical mystery tour. Every one of us every day get into the zone. I mean, several times a day. The zone is nothing more than just having just total absor absorption and being engaged in the moment in whatever activity you're doing. I mean, one of the greatest you know uh, examples I've ever heard of was the zone uh, was from Jack and Barbara Nicholas. When Jack Nicholas, you know, was after uh, home, he's sitting in front of the TV with a, you know, a big quart of ice cream, eating ice cream, because that was one of Jack's delicacies. And I think there was Jackie Jr. And I think Barbara, you know, had Steve, and I think she might have been pregnant for another one. And you know, she was in the kitchen getting, you know, supper ready. And she was yelling for Jack to come because the water was boiling over. And here was Jack in front of the TV. I mean, he was just immersed, just eating that ice cream. And, and Barbara's going, Jack. Jack. And finally she goes, Jack. And he finally looks up. He goes, what? You know, you, are you, you, you need something? She goes, I've been yelling at you for the last two minutes. And he goes, oh, I, I didn't hear you. You see, so really being in the zone is really what we talk about. Total focus concentration, meaning that you are absorbed into whatever activity in the sensory system you're processing information in at that time. So it is total mindfulness. Your mind is full of really what's going on in the moment. And all of us do this. I mean, we're watching a you know, TV show or watching a football game or we're involved in some activity. 
time ceases to exist. We are totally in the present moment. And that's really what being engaged in the moment is all about. And that's why so you Will, hear So Will's in the zone when I'm trying to talk to him and he's just not responding and not paying attention. That, he's just in the zone. No, that could be selective attention, Will. He's oh, he's just trying, just trying he's to, just tuning I'm, I'm he's just to tuning you out. He's just tuning okay, you out. Okay, that's what it is. But see, that's that's a great, you know, uh, mental skill as well to be able to attenuate or gate out or disconnect from all of the distractions, all right? And that's really, you know, where when you you hear people who have sort of rabbit ears and they hear everything they're totally their attention isn't focused on this yeah. one thing it's focused on everything and everything around them they hear everything they're in tune to everything so let's talk about you know how do you really get into the zone the zone is really what i need to know the zone and if, if everybody all the listeners and viewers you know listen to this this is just huge okay now I'm going to give you guys, and I'll do a little, you know, session here. I'm going to hold up four different numbers. Like here's here's the number, that's number one right there. But I want you to total up these four numbers in your head, and you know the viewers at home can do it. Don't as ask well. Will this question. Okay, all, all right, right, here it is. Here okay. I'm, I'm already this. lost. Okay, I'm going to give you four numbers. Okay, right. but I do not want you to be thinking about sixteen. Sixteen is the number I don't want you to be thinking about. All right. Okay, so what was the number I told you not to think about? Whatever it was, I wasn't paying attention. Whatever it was, I don't know. 16, Doc. Yeah, 16. You, guys, you guys are pretty savvy. Okay, here we go. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Just, and just don't, you know, total them up in your mind. Right here, total focus right here. Here we go. What was the total? 10. Did you get that, Will? Here we go. Let's do yeah. It again. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, one more time. Here we go. All right. Total. Ten. Beautiful. You know, you got it just right. That's really what, you know, great focus is about. I You're thought 16 every time you put a finger up, dog. I, ain't gonna yeah, lie. Exactly. I, was, like, I, was, like, I was like, I was like square root of okay, no. four, you know, four times. But, but here's here's what I want you guys to understand is that when you are processing information in the moment, when you are here, right here, this is where I need to be, your mind is totally focused on execution, focusing on execution. I'm into this moment right now. You're not you know, thinking about what if, what could be. You're saying, this is what I need to do right now. And that's why Nike, you know, those three words in their slogan, just do it. When you're doing something, you are engaged in that moment. And that's the whole point. When you're actually you know, in, involved in the process, you are right here. And even if you listen to Victor in his interviews, and this is what I love to listen to winners talk about their interviews. They, they asked him, where were you at? I mean, you're in this zone. He goes, well, I really don't know if I was zone, but I was just really totally one after one after one until I done. In fact, I didn't realize until I looked at the leaderboard really what I was doing until I, I saw I might have a chance. And when you're talking about that, Doug, you're talking about when someone makes you aware yes. of your awareness, right? And so what happens when you do that? When someone says, wow, you're playing really good, Will, Doug, keep it going. Okay. That's the worst. You're sitting there going, damn, I am playing pretty good. Uh, you know, and what happens, you start looking at the scorecard and you start totaling up and then you start projecting, well, if I can make a couple more birdies, I could shoot my own personal record or, or, or shoot my A or whatever it is. What you need to do right then is realize one thing. You need to stop all of that the counting, the totaling, projecting. And I always have a rubber band here. This is, you know, and, and Doug being one of my students, you worked using the rubber band, snapping the rubber band, snapping it hard and it telling yourself. It hurt me, Doc. God. Yeah, just, just snapping it, just snapping. <laughs> snapping yourself back and go, hold on. If I'm playing really good right now, that's confirmation of one thing. I'm working. I'm mm. working today. And I remember the great New Zealander, player grant wait one time he was doing an interview after the phoenix open he went on to shoot 60 and they asked him they said was this what probably one of your best putting days he goes no not really he goes but i got the six seven under and i started getting into waters that were deep 
And all of us who have actually swum in a, a lake or ocean, when you start, you know, swimming and it's, you know, it feels nice and warm, all of a sudden the water starts feeling cold. Yeah, it does. Ooh, well, it's a little bit deeper. It's a little bit darker here. What do, what do most people do? They go, oh, maybe I need to go back. <laughs> you don't go back. You just keep swimming. You just keep doing the same thing you've been doing. And, and that's how we actually get through that comfort zone. And so Grant said this, and I thought it was great because he said it in that great New Zealand accent of his. He says, some days, today's your day. <laughs> and I love, and I always love the hearing of that interview. He goes, he goes, I got to a point where I didn't feel any trepidation, any doubt. He goes, today's my day. And I think that's really what happens when we have this peak performance experience, getting to the zone, or we have a great flow state. We just say, hey, let's continue doing what we're doing and just maintain the flow. Let's go. Let's, you know, instead of sitting here going, oh, I, oh, I hope I could hold on to it, put it down, keep moving forward. And that's the whole point about one after one after one until Will or Doug is done, because one is the most important number in golf. And if you can stay focused, I'm playing each shot, one shot, one shot, one shot at a time. That sounds you're, so you're damn gold. cliche. I just want to play one shot, Will. Just hit the shot I mean, after the shot. But, Go ahead. But here's here's the point. I really want to you know say this. People say, yeah, these all these cliches. The point is, the Jack Nicholas's, the Annika Sorenstams, the Tiger Woods, the Arnold Palmers, the greatest of the greats, understand is that the cliches are the golden ticket to success. Because everyone else talks about winning majors or doing this. And each one of them said the same thing. I play my game. I beat the golf course. I play one shot at a time. And they've actually you know, put down the pedestal. They put down the trophy. And they do the one thing as a golfer, as a performer, that you're supposed to be doing. And that is to play your game the way you see it and to beat the golf course. And if you do that... If you just do that, I mean, one after one after one, that is a mental discipline because this whole great journey that we're on, it does begin with a single step. And you can eat an elephant, but you have to eat it one bite at a time. We hear these cliches all the time. So this is kind of really what you need to have. Absolutely. I, 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 can't, I can't agree with you more. Um, <laughs> my, golf, my golf coach used to say all the time, uh, James Black, God, God rest his soul, rest in peace. Uh, you used to always say, you know, um, physical education, one of the most important parts of education, the athletic body has to find the right mind. And when you have that one, one shot at a time, you're definitely uh, in alignment. Uh, but, you know, I want to kind of move forward when it comes to uh, you, Dr. Bob. Uh huh. So w when we talk about like, you know, and I, I think this is another entry point to the game, uh, another entry point to uh, being part of the game of golf. How did you get your start as as a mental guru, mental golf coach? <laughs> oh, yes, that's a loaded question, Will. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, well, uh, four here's, minute for okay. uh, well, here, here's, <laughs> wait, here, here's here's the point. Here's the point. When I was uh, you know in high school, I I didn't start picking up the game until I was about fourteen. But you have to understand, when I was a senior in high school, I was four foot 10, 86 pounds. I could crush the ball about 185, 190 mm -hmm. off the tee. Uh, and so I sort of, you know, I was a great little athlete. I had great eye-hand coordination. I had, you know, they used to call me winners the wedge, and I could get it up and down. They didn't hit it very far. Uh, I had a great short game, but they said, save that for the, for the green. I mean, I could actually hit it very short, and I was always 40, 50 yards behind everyone. So I had to rely on thinking and you know, thinking in my way around the course. I had to rely on my mental toughness. Uh, sometimes, you know, people said I play with like a chip on my shoulder. It wasn't so much that is that I knew I, I could play this game. And so as, you know, time went on and I grew a little bit and I played at every level and I just started, you know, to really understand how important, you know, the mind game was. And I remember going to talk to Dr. Gary Wyron back in, I think, 19... 80, 1981, who is director of learning and research. Wonderful man. He said, I don't really know where, you know, this is going to go. He goes, but you're into visualization. I, I got started in sports vision, sports medicine. I had all my different degrees in physical education and psychology. And then I uh, entered, you know, the University of Virginia with, you know, Dr. Bob Rotella and Dr. Linda Bunker, who were just, you know, giants, you know, of, in motor learning and sports psychology. 
And then I, you know, hooked up with, you know, David Ledbetter about 25 years ago. And over the last 40, 50 years, I mean, it's just been this accumulation of knowledge and helping start, you know, the Nike golf schools across America and being a coach at the University of Virginia. Uh, it's all been about one thing. And you are what you think you are. It isn't just the law of attraction, you know, thinking good stuff. It's the law of creation. And when you have the law of attraction, you, you think this, but you actually do purpose, purposeful things to get you to where you want to go. That's when you have real power now. And so every day of my life, well, since I was about 20 years old, it's been dedicated to understanding what confidence is all about. Because confidence, mm -hmm. most people think is just the belief. Confidence is like a fighter. You got, you know, I believe I can do this. But why people love confidence is this right hand cross, the knockout punch. It says, I'm not afraid. I'm fearless. You know, let's go. I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to screw up. And that's why people love the feeling of confidence. But for many people, it's a very transitory, temporary state. And what I'm trying to do is make it very stable, very enduring, and make people a, a tenacious, confident athlete. What, what, what type of advice would you give uh, individuals who are trying to be that, that motivational speaker, that, that uh, sports psychologist? Because they can't call you all the time. They can't call Bob Rotella. I mean, is there, is there, is there yeah. certain books that you advise them to read? Is, you know, what, and, I'm, and I'm really speaking to some of the golf coaches out there, high school and college. You know, what, what, what type of you know, books would you advise them to read or what type of material to, to kind of help them in their knowledge in the space? One of the greatest books that I read uh, early in my training uh, was The Magic of Thinking Big uh, mm. by David Schwartz. Also another by Claude Bristol was The Magic of Believing. I mean, these two books, I mean, they're like 1930, 1940, 1950. You might think it's dated, uh, dated information, but commercially it might be you know, not ever, but, it, but when I want to say commercially, it's evergreen. You know, the message is, is time withstanding. I mean, you are what you think you are. And that's the whole point. People always ask me all the time, Dr. Dr. Bob, do I have the talent to make it on tour? Do I have the talent to make it, you know, D1 or play in college? And I'm saying the people who make it, you know, on the tour, the people who make it success in life, the people who play in college, are the people who believe they belong there and they find a way it doesn't matter when you know but they find a way to get there and i always love what kurt warner said who won the super bowl for the st louis rams years ago he goes i always knew i was going to be great and i knew i was going to win i, I just didn't know when i was going to get there but i but i always believed it i always knew it and, and when i look at you know at you two guys here and Will, you know, I've, I've known you, you know, for years, but Doug, you know, I've known you for a long time. And the first time I met Doug Smith, I said, this guy has got the huxpa. He's got the pizzazz. He <laughs> believes in himself. And, and he did. He had this unwavering belief. And now I look at you too, and I'm so happy and so proud, you know, that you guys have, you know, gotten to where you are. And, but that's really where it is. It is the power of your own belief. And because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. I think I'm a collection though of of people that like like you that kind of kind of made me think bigger than I think my upbringing allowed me to think mm. if that makes any yeah. sense. Yeah. I th I think you you know folks like you especially when I was working at Champions Gate it was I mean you you were Dr. Bob and you were spending time to talk to me and it was one of those things where and I I I really do value and appreciate it but I think there's these people too that that God puts in your life or however you believe that that will actually pull you to to get that out of you right because I'll be honest with you if you would have told us me and Will when when we met each other back in 2006 or 7 Dr. Bob this is where we'd be right now I'd be like get the hell out of right, here right. and I appreciate you saying that doc but look in the spirit of time we've got yeah. I've got, I've been wrestling with something Okay. And and I'm going to send you out of here because Will's decided to go to Q school. So th this is this is I don't know if it's the dumbest decision or the smartest decision. We're going to get there. I believe but I believe two more two more, two more <laughs> yeah. points for you today, Doc. And look. Okay. You're Zach Johnson. You're looking yeah. at how this season has has pr progressed. You you've got a guy Justin Thomas who doesn't make the FedEx Cup playoffs. He doesn't make it inside the top 70. Still ranked top 15 in the world. You're going to Rome 
outside of all the, the numerical data, the what's your record, blah, 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 blah. You're Zach Johnson. How do you evaluate Justin Thomas's psyche to maybe vie for what, a captain's pick? My first thing I would tell, you know, Zach, and you, you've got to go with your heart. you got to go with your gut. You can't go with the politics. You can't go with the favorites. You can't go with, you know, the media. You can't go with the press and the pressure that says, hey, what about JT? What about JT? Listen, you've got players on that team, you know, that are out there for, you know, his captain's pick that will make unbelievable, you know, teammates. This might not be JT's year. I mean, that's just the way it is. And the point of it is, is that Zach Johnson has to kind of put down, you know, his relationships and all of this. And he has to make a very cold, objective decision that he can live with. Because you've got people like Brooks, like Bryson DeChambeau, Lucas Glover. You've got Keegan Bradley. You've got a bunch of people out there. You've already got, you know, some great studs in that team already. Young, yeah. You know, but the main thing is for him, you could sit here all day and he has to make, you know, tough calls. And whether he gives, you know, JT the call yay or gives JT the call nay, he has to be able to say, listen, you know, this is a tough call for me to make, but that's why I'm the captain and that's why I'm making this call. So for him, he's got to actually, you know, do it his way. And hopefully he'll make, you know, the prudent decision and it'll be based on his heart and his gut. But, you know, to be pressured just because somebody has a reputation or they have some type of ranking, where are they at right now? Because when you see, you know, Lucas Glover, who's really, you know, hot, or you have somebody like Bryson DeChambeau, who has, you know, the experience, who is a powerhouse and against the Europeans, you have to ask yourself, you know, in the final analysis, what do we want to do? We want to come together as a team. And this is my feeling here, Doug and Will is that if I am the, you know, the captain of this team, I'm not concerned about making friends and having, you know, a, a family, you know, marshmallow roast, kumbaya. All right. I want to go over there <laughs> and I want to win the Ryder Cup. And I'll tell you what, and this is another thing that most people don't understand. I'm kind of old school, but I think old school is cool school. Okay? I, I agree. Go ahead. Let is it that, out, listen, you don't have to be friends to be great teammates. You know, mm. when you've got people who respect each other as professionals, all right, you know, hey, I want to play with this guy, okay? I don't really like him all that much, but by God, you know, when we put on the red, white, and blue, we now are under this cloak. We're playing for America. And so I want, you know, somebody, if I'm going to war with somebody, hey, listen, we may have differences, but that's, that's the opposition, okay? And I'm not trying to equate this to war or what, everything, but the point of it is, yeah, I mean, no, I, love I, I want, I want, you know, teammates that, you know, I mean, that when, when they go down, I can trust them. I believe in them, you know, and I know that if I'm not there, they're going to be there and they're going to be there for me. And that as a, as a captain, that is the ultimate responsibility for a Zach Johnson or any coach. And, you know, over the years, you take a look at the captain's like Hal Sutton and Tom Watson and all, you know, and Zinger and everybody who's been a captain, all right? And, you know, Fury, all these people, they had to make tough decisions. Yep. And whether they win, whether they lose, hey, they did the very best they could. So my hat's off to, you know, to Captain yeah. Zach. I know he'll do a great job and he's got, you know, some great, you know, assistance some great people around him. But in the end, in the final analysis, you got to let go of the politics. You got to let go of the press, and you've got to get some people on that team that will be great players because that's what the Ryder Cup's about. It's playing the game. That sums up Doug and our relationship. Don't really like each other too much, but we understand the <laughs> ultimate goal. And 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 think about it. I, I don't know if JT is going to pull uh, what Doug Smith did in his early years. Had a great relationship with the captain just to get on the team. So we don't know how it's going to work. Uh, but ha, ha, ha. either Thank way, you, Will, jerk. <laughs> oh no, but Will's either going way. to Q school, Doctor Bob. So he actually might need. I don't know. Dr. Hey, what, Will, any, anything I can are, help you with? Anything I, I, I will. will throw my hat in the ring for you, Will. I I, I would be honored, you know, to, to help. Doc, as trained as you are, I don't think you have enough to help him. Right here, I say I say this. I, I'm saying this because <laughs> the thing about it is, 
I, and I know this is probably it's probably not the smartest thing for me to say. By me not practicing as much and putting so much pressure on myself, I have I have been scoring very well. Now, granted, I have you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and moonwalk out of this. All right, Dr. Bob, I appreciate it. No, 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 it, no. Hold, hold. Here's 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 the one thing I can tell you right now is that everyone starts thinking, oh, I've got Q school. I've really got to get serious about this. Oh, I've got you know a big tournament coming out. I got to get really serious about this. Angels fly high because they take themselves lightly, okay? They allow themselves to fly. The point of it is you're playing some of your very best golf right now Bars. because you're playing golf. You're playing golf. Mm -hmm. You're not playing, oh, I have to play like a professional. I have to play well to make it through Q school. That's, that's a different animal. That's a distraction. So you can just keep playing loose, free, and lightly, and just keep Play. playing the game, you know, you'll be just fine. Exactly. AKA no practice. I'm just going to show up and see y'all. <laughs> so, but look, real quick, Dr. Bob, before we get you out of here, I want to say sure. thank you because if there's any lesson, all the jokes and conversation and mentor moments, if there's anything I've ever learned from you, you said something to me that echoed through decades. You said any player, every player is going to hit a bad shot. Only the good players will recover. So if you hit a bad shot, you should be excited because that's the only time you get to prove how good you are. Now, I, I doubt you remember even telling me that because it was in a conversation full of things. But I will say hitting bad shots and like running to them because you told like learning that if you want to really show someone you're good, every good player is going to hit a good shot. Every, every player is going to hit a bad shot, but the good ones recover. You should be excited to hit the next shot because that's where you show your talent. That was just enough cocky advice and enough like almost humility in the advice at the same time that I have never forgot. And to this day, I still skip to shots where I've hit it like the worst first tee participant, underrated tour participant in the world. <laughs> and, and, and by, and by that, that works because he hit a lot of bad shots. It's, it's funny because people always talk about your thoughts and possibility thinking. I've never told anybody to, to think pos positive, but I've always been about possibility thinking. And I remember Herb Elliott, who was the great you know, middle distance mile runner, you know, from Australia years ago, back in the late 50s, 60s. He said this about confidence and about arrogance. He goes, in order to actually set a world record, and to think that you can run a mile faster than anyone else in the world. It takes an unbelievable amount of arrogance to really even think you could do that. Mm. But at the same time, you have to have the absolute humility to go out and then just do it. And I think, you know, that right there, the ego, the arrogance, the, the confidence to say, I can do this, matched up with the preparedness, with, you know, the acknowledgement that I'm going to do the work and that I'm ready to go out because when you know that you have the skills, will you allow yourself at that moment of truth to focus on execution and let all the good stuff come out? Mm. And, the, and the greatest fear that most athletes, the great athletes, the great golfers that I work with, the greatest fear that they have is not the fear of failure. It's the fear of inaccessibility, meaning I'm not able to access and tap into the talent that I know that I have. And if I can actually do that, you know, because up until this point in time, I have been underachieving. I'm, I'm over-motivated. I'm working hard as hell, but I'm not getting the results I want. So if I can help an athlete access that talent and allow them to free it up and trust and develop, you know, that deep-seated confidence that everything's going to be okay. Because I just told, you know, a young player the other day, you know, a young college player, they go, I'm missing putts. I'm missing putts and it really screwed me up. I'm going, hey, great putters miss putts. And I always remember Seve Ballesteros at the Masters. He four putted from six feet on number 16. And he goes into the press room and he goes, well, the first putt, uh, I miss. The second putt, I miss. The third putt, I miss. The fourth putt, go in the hole. Mm -hmm. And people were laughing. He goes, why were you laughing? I tried on every one. And so that's the whole point. Great putters miss shots but they also rebound and that's what makes them great. They have the grit to hang in there and hit the next shot and keep moving forward one after one until Will and Doug are done. 
Oh that's my goodness. What, that's what it's all about. Dr. Bob, thank you so much coming in here, going beyond the fairway with Will Lowry and myself. Dr. Bob, what are you working on? How do the people get a hold of you? How do you get on your calendar? Let them know. Well, I'll tell you what, they can reach me at theconfidencedoctor.com. You know, they can reach me directly that way or drbobwinters.com. I'm also with David Ledbetter at the David Ledbetter Golf Academy here at Reunion, Florida. Or they can actually just reach me at, you know, this number. And I'm going to give you my number so you can actually reach me directly. It's 407-340-7785. And I do take calls. And I I love to work with motivated students. Doesn't care how old, how young, how much talent you have. You know, and I'll tell you what. I just love, you know, to work with all golfers. Dr. Right, Dr. Bob is like Mike Jones. I didn't know Dr. Bob was the Mike Jones of this of the golf space. He giving out his number uh, on the podcast, Will. But, hey, Dr. Right. Dr. Bob, you know I love you, man. You're one of my favorite voices, personalities, and minds in the game. Thank you so much for jumping in here. Golf Channel, NBC Sports. Listen, follow, subscribe. Dr. Bob, that's my sports psychologist. So if you want to, well, come into the studio, he can help you do that too. But, Dr. Bob, we'll talk to you, brother. Hey, listen, I want to tell you one last thing. I want you guys both to know this. This is my, sort of my you know, end line, my tagline. The moment you change your mind, you change your game. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Mm. Appreciate that, Dr. Bob. Ours. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. B.